Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development a web a Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to Crop Talk for September 9th, and um, as uh, we're getting through harvest here, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to get some of the farm production extension people to uh, come on and talk a bit about how uh, how harvest is going through uh, in their area, as well as kind of how the year has gone. And so we're gonna have some uh, presentations from uh, Rajan Picard, uh, Terry Buss, Ingrid Christensen, and Amir Farouk. And uh, what we're gonna do is uh, just go through all of them and if there's some questions, we'll answer them at the end. Um, then we're gonna go to our crop scouting panel and we're gonna be answering your questions. And uh, we had a lot of questions come in this past week regarding the frost and and actually I, I should have put the wind too because there's been a lot of questions regarding the wind as well. So uh, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of those uh, in uh, probably throughout the whole uh, uh, crop talk today as uh, everybody talks I think that's something that uh, affected a large area of the province uh, and uh, so there's going to be definitely some issues there so to get started I've got a couple slides and uh, first one just uh, the general slide as to where we are in harvest and uh, we'll get a better update from the regions when uh, the different uh, extension specialists come on but uh, right now you know we're we're getting close to being where we normally are in our three-year average. We're still a little bit behind. And uh, I think the biggest thing right now is getting the, the crop to dry down. I think that a lot of producers are uh, hearing a lot of uh, uh, comments regarding uh, the crop not wanting to dry down right now. When you look at uh, something that we'll be talking about uh, uh, today, uh, the wind uh, that we had the other day, and you can see the maximum wind speeds throughout the uh, throughout the province here and you can see where we were uh, definitely uh, in uh, in the uh, mid to high you know 60s to 70 ranges in a lot of areas uh, some places did reach over the 80 but I think in general we were you know mid 60s to mid 70 range in in, in most of the province so that uh, created a few issues with standing and uh, and uh, swath crop and then right after the wind, uh, the next couple of days, we got our frost and you can see where the frost showed up throughout the province. It seems to hit the western side, uh, the majority of the western side of the province. And we had temperatures as low as uh, minus five. I did hear a couple of people saying well, almost as low as minus eight, but I have uh, heard a lot of the minus threes to minus five range. So uh, definitely uh, a frost that, uh, uh, could do some damage and I think the biggest concern about that frost uh, was uh, I think around 11 12 o'clock at night um, it is uh, it was about minus one already and uh, it froze for probably you know seven to eight hours uh, over the night and uh, so I think uh, that's probably the, the biggest uh, the biggest damage that was done is the duration of the frost is and and it did get fairly cold like um, you know uh, seven hours of minus one is, uh, you know, not bad, but uh, you get eight hours or seven hours of minus two to minus five, then, you know, you're going to see some damage. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later as we go through the uh, crop talk today. Again, this is just a, a map from our weather stations showing all the different temperatures uh, at the different weather stations. And you can see where the line is, where uh the frost was basically to the west of uh of this and you know maybe some isolated pockets on the eastern side but that's uh that's basically where the the line was drawn for uh for the frost so now we're going to get into our updates from our farm extension specialists uh, we have uh uh, presenting today, we have Ingrid Christensen, we've got uh, Terry Buss, Ray Jean Picard, and Amir Farouk. So we're going to start with Ingrid. And so, Laurie, if you could give the screen over to Ingrid, we will start with her update.
And you're on mute too, Ingrid. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you hear me okay now? You bet, Ingrid. Okay, good. And my screen has just gone black. So, <laughs> I guess I'll just start since it's, it's black. I'm hoping that you're able to see the slides. Lori, if you could give the screen back to me, I've got our slides on my. Oh, oh, where did they go? They were here, Ingrid. Just give me one second. <laughs> Technology, right? You know what, Laurie, give the screen to Rajan and uh, we'll start with Rajan and I'll get the slides up here. Okay, Rajan, don't forget to unmute yourself. <clears throat> yes, good morning. How is this? Perfect, Rajan, go ahead. Very good. Well, good morning again. Crop Talk, September 9th, 2020. I'm the uh, Farm Production Extension Specialist, crops and dealing mostly with cereals, but other crops as well. So a little bit of an update here, I guess, of what we've gone through, <clears throat> mostly in central region. Specifically, I work in Somerset, which is a little bit more southwest central region on the edge of the escarpment or above the escarpment. So that's going to be my perspective this morning. Uh, Rajan, you've clicked uh, mute. So, do you want to unmute yourself, please? Sorry, two. That's all right. There we go. Okay, so a bit of a slow start this year. So, uh, again, some of the key things here we were wet. Again, moisture saturated soils to begin with, with the season. And that was to do with all the rain that we had last fall. Uh, everyone, everyone will remember that. Uh, some of the key issues, again, because of this, uh, 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 leading to this slow start, I guess almost no field preparation was done in the fall 2019, and I'm sure that's uh, probably the case in many other places. There was little fertilization done in the fall 2019 as well, again, relating to the, to the wet fall. Uh, below normal pre precipitation for May and June this year, which was actually uh, beneficial to some extent to allow for some of the soils to to dry up and warm up somewhat. Uh, so it did cause a bit of a delay there for, for to get started. But again, because of the relatively drier spring start conditions, uh, it, it allowed for uh, a relatively orderly return to the field, although with some delays. And again, so that was uh, some of the some of the key issues here to, to start. Next, not sure why it's so slow here. Oh, there we go. So again, this is just a map to show the soil moisture here in Manitoba again, and I've highlighted in red in that box there, more or less the area that I'm and that I work within again. So relatively, uh, you know, soil soil moisture was was plenty, so not not an issue there to uh, uh, for, to get the start uh, the, the the year started. So this is the a map of the fall so, soil moisture fall 2019. So percent of available water, water holding capacity in the top 120 centimeters. So basically near to or pretty much at saturation levels across the province, including south central part of the of the province here in, in our region. A little bit of an overview here. I always like to look at the broad perspective here of things, what's happening. So going back to 1993 here, this is a 30 or so year uh, diagram that shows the, the proportion, this is not acres, this is the proportion of cereals, oil seeds and legumes or nitrogen fixing crops in Manitoba. <clears throat> and uh, we're seeing a gradual decline of cereals and a gradual increase in 
uh, legume or nitrogen fixing crops and oil seeds in red is fairly stable but the point i wanted to make here is that uh, at about 50 percent of cereals is about a nice number a, a, a sustainable number to in terms of proportion of acreage for cereals versus broad leaves which is oil seeds and legumes so we see a bit of a dip here in the legumes and the nitrogen fixing crops since 2017 and that's mostly due to soybeans uh, <clears throat> just to show a little bit the, the, the season we've just gone through here in, in uh, 2020, from uh, uh, the beginning of the year to uh, uh, till, till the end of, of August, at least here, we see at least for summer set, we're below normal for precipitation, and uh, but above normal for, for heat units. So again, it was beneficial to start a bit drier to allow things to dry, and a little bit warmer than normal to to allow things to catch up. So we're kind of, we're right in the middle of harvest here right now. So that's been a bit of the story here this uh, this summer, this season. Uh, <clears throat> some of the issues that we deal with usually, again, is fissum head blight in terms of cropping. And I just put up a couple of slides here between July, uh, one is uh, July 10th and one is July 15th. You'll see in South Central, <clears throat> excuse me, the municipality of Lorne, if you can see my, my pointer here, July 10th, we're relatively moderate for head blight risk. And July 15th, it was high. So again, things change and varied quite a bit this summer. And I'm sure everyone will have see, seen some symptoms of what physium head blight looks like uh, in, in, uh, in, that, in wheat in particular. So that's uh, some of the challenges we continue to face year after year. I just wanted to show we don't have an HU in Manitoba. We do a, a physium head blight survey and I have the last 10 years uh, physium head blight index uh, based on the, the survey results that we've done and but this year again we don't have this year obviously for 2020 ready yet but uh, I would suspect it will be below uh, even 2019 or no higher for sure it's it was very, basically quite low in terms of uh, head blight index or, or or symptoms of head blight on wheat this year. Uh, again, the results will come out at, at some point later, but the 10-year average is 1.09. The last three were well below, were between, uh, yeah, below 0.5 of 1%, so quite low. So it looks like this year will be in, in that low range as well. So good news in, in terms of that, at least. <clears throat> Uh, specifically in, in this area this year, something new to deal with, cereal armyworm on wheat. And there's a few slides here that were provided for, to me by a local grower. And mostly there was a fall ride that was affected significantly this year. Other crops, there were signs of the of this cereal armyworm, but nothing really worthwhile controlling. In that particular field with this grower, he did have to apply some, some control measures, but Overall, it didn't really affect uh, other crops, the cereal crops too severely, at least not to the point here that you can see on this particular slide. Uh, in terms of insect monitoring this year, uh, province-wide, we had 25 traps for diamondback moth, one of the insects that is being monitored consistently. And uh, basically in, in my area here at South Central, we had low levels well gladstone was the highest count with 57 as you can see here uh, rhineland at 52 and portage at 15 so it dropped off rapidly most traps had very low numbers and i'm not aware that there was any control measures applied for that particular insect this year for for uh, in canola at least birth army worm is another insect that's being monitored 21 traps across the province 18 of 21 had low risks three of 21 had uncertain uh, risk levels, and actually all of those were in my area, South Central, with Dunry at 485, Killarney 472, and Somerset 400. Again, I haven't heard anyone that actually applied control measures for that particular insect, so good news there again. Next slide here. Okay, in terms of other insect monitoring, again, grasshoppers is something we watch for, and there were some pockets uh, of that particular insect. There were some control measures applied. Portage, Gladstone, and Emerson come to mind. Uh, it there was other places where it was visible, but the crop was seemed to be able to to sustain the the the, the, the feeding and damage. And this particular slide here, this is a uh, 
near to where I live, there's a, a wheat field you can see in the encircled some of the smaller, some of the damage done here by the, the, the grasshoppers, but that crop, I know that particular field was never sprayed, although there was pressure on the edges, but the crop still held up uh, quite nicely. Uh, in terms of harvest results to date, uh, quickly here I've got uh, hybrid rye. Harvest is basically done and the crop is probably ranging between 90 to 100 bushels and fairly consistently from uh, from around the area here. So that was a, a pretty good uh, crop. Uh, not really any winter wheat that I've seen or even heard of this past year, this season. So at least not around here. So I don't have numbers to, to report. Spring wheat harvest, uh, mostly done probably 85% plus uh, 50 to 100 bushels an acre range, probably around 60 to 70 average. <clears throat> Oats uh, uh, harvest also wrapping up and uh, getting close uh, close to the end here, at about 90% plus done, uh, 90 to 170 bushels an acre range, probably averaging 120 to 130. Barley harvest, again, also mostly done, 95% plus, uh, 70 to 120 bushels an acre range, probably with around 80 to 90 averaging, it sounds like, and those crops, those cereal cranes have coming up, coming off with, with fairly good, good quality uh, uh, top grades as well so far. Field peas, uh, again, mostly done, probably over 99%, I put 90 here, but it's, uh, it's higher than that. Uh, there's a few late fields out there, but uh, good yields, uh, 50 to 85 are reported, probably will end up in a 65 to 70 average or 75. Canoa harvest progressing, we're a little bit uh, delayed here on the escarpment, a little higher, a little cooler, and we're probably 35 to 50 percent done. <clears throat> I'm, I'm thinking more, as a regional uh, perspective, a little bit less than that for where I am on the escarpment. Uh, yields not extraordinary, 35 to 50 probably will fall in or settle around the 40 to 45, it sounds like so far. And more harvest to come, there's flax, not too many acres, but the crop looks good so far. Soybeans, the crop is maturing and should bring what looks like a, an average to slightly above average crop. And corn, again, fewer acres up on the escarpment, more so in the valley, but it's uh, the, the, the corn crop looks good and expecting good or decent results from that as well. And that's basically my update here this morning. So if there's any questions or turn it over to Ingrid. Hey, thanks, Rajan. Um, I think what we'll do now is we'll, uh, we will turn it over to Ingrid and we'll, uh, Lori, if you could show my screen. Okay, Ingrid. Okay, good. You bet. Got your first screen up. All right. Well, thanks, Lionel. I'm going to give a bit of a of a harvest update for the interleague region. My name's Ingrid Christensen, and I work out of the Toulon office. Um, a lot of the information that's been given given by um, by Rajan is is somewhat similar to us. You can see that uh, that we are ahead of the game also on growing degree days or corn heat units. We are catching up now on rainfall. We were, um, for a good chunk of the year, we were actually running in 60% of normal range. Uh, we're still at a number of stations that are below the 80%. Um, as Rajan mentioned, everything was wet to start with. We also were dealing with crops that were were out over winter and had to be harvested this year, not a whole lot of field work. So that got us off to a late start. But as soon as as soon as the crop was in the ground, everything turned dry. It was cold. So there's lots of early season stresses, which was a little frustrating after we'd been so wet. We didn't have a significant rain again until about uh, uh, towards the end of June. And um, so that certainly affected the crop all all year long. Final next slide. We've been pretty lucky according to um, the maps that, that Lionel showed earlier on. We have pretty much escaped the frost so far, fingers crossed. Any frost that we did have has been for a fairly short duration, so that's a nice break for us and we hope to keep it away. And next slide. Oh, and click again. Sorry. Oops. There. 
I just wanted to put this one in as a reminder to myself. This is actually the result of the late spring frost on fall rye. And we certainly did have lots of, of stresses on the crops. Besides cold and dry, we had a, a late season frost that affected a number of, of crops, uh, mostly the fall rye, the winter wheat. Um, we didn't have a lot in the interlake, but there were a few fields affected. Another one that we expect um, was affected were some of the forage seed crops, you know, things like uh, Timothy and perennial ryegrass, even tree fall, we believe was affected by that late spring frost. Lots of other um, stresses as well. Rajan mentioned the, the armyworm. That was a big issue for us in the cereals as well as in some of the forage seed grasses and some were quite significant. So far more spring than this year for insecticides, insect, insect control than normal and grasshoppers were definitely a big part of that story. Rajan put up, up about three sites that had some spraying. I would say that probably every region or every area within the region did significant grasshopper spraying, both headlands and entire fields. And uh, quite a number of times there was um, several applications, unfortunately. So. Finally, the pressure is off now, but if you walk out into a field in lots of places, there's still quite a few grasshoppers. Uh, next slide. So with the rains, we're now at a standstill for harvest and baling. Uh, we did get off to a, a pretty good start. A lot of that was because of premature ripening because we were so dry. We had the, we generally had rains in in late June, uh, a lot of people didn't have a significant rain again until about the beginning of August. Some had, um, you know, an inch of rain middle of July, but that was tremendously scattered. So certainly the yields in the interlake are very, um, very dependent on whether you got an extra rain or two. Um, next slide. So we are mostly finished cereal harvest. Um, there are a few fields standing out. On the upper left is oats, and certainly with that wind that we had, there has been some shattering. So not sure the implications on some of that standing crop, but uh, I think in places it will be significant. And still some wheat out. We figure that we're probably in the 70 to 80 percent done for the cereals. Um, fall rye, of course, is done, and winter wheat. Uh, we've had pretty decent yields. Barley ranges from 60 to 110. Spring wheat yields um, reported in the 45 to 95 range. Average yields we're guesstimating at 55 to 65. Um, very happy with the quality. Since we've had some of the rains, there's a bit of bleaching, but quality still good. And proteins are decent, ranging from 12.5 to 14.5. And those lower proteins are on some of those higher yields. Oat yields have also been generally really good, 90 to 130, with some as high as, a, as 150 to 160. And we think the average is going to be somewhere in that 100 to 120 range. And a lot of the, those lower yields is just because of um, very dry conditions, not much for, for rain. And I think talking to most guys with the lower yields, a lot of them say that they are thrilled to have what they did get based on how the crop looked. Next slide, and click again. So you can see that uh, um, some of the crops have been off for a while, and with the rains, we've got some good regrowth in the tracks. And uh, the nice thing about this, this harvest is that there's been lots of straw bales, and right after the combine, and those bales are coming off the field quite quickly. A little bit slower now that some of the fields are getting soft, but certainly has been lots of Lots of uh, straw bales, so that's been terrific. They are uh, greatly needed. Uh, one thing I noticed this year, and it may have happened in the past as well, but with more peas this year, uh, there has been a lot of pea residue baled as well, so that should give some uh, an additional source of protein uh, or feed source to cattle. Uh, pea yields were also generally very good. Um, uh, people were probably averaging somewhere in the 60 bushel an acre range, so quite pleased with that. 
Uh, next slide, Lionel. Okay, on to canola. Uh, most of the intended canola swapping is complete. Uh, any, almost everything for standing crop is waiting to be combined. And of course, part of the story on canola this year is that there were uh, a number of fields that were reseeded late because besides that cold weather, we also had issues, huge issues with flea beetles. So lots of damage there. This field is actually um, going to be straight cut. The story there was it had uh, corn on it and that didn't come off until this spring. So, so it's a bit later, but um, in general, the early canola yields are from 25 to about 50 and we're anticipating 35 to 40 bushels for an average. Not the best and a little bit disappointing, but given the year pretty, pretty decent. There were lots of thin crops because of all those early season pressures and then insect pressures, lack of rain. So all things considered looking pretty good. Uh, click again, Lionel, there should be a couple more slides here. Yeah, standing canola looking, looking pretty decent. So next slide. Okay, off on the left, um, it is actually flax straw, so at least that crop is harvested. On the right is some canola, canola and swath. The fields that I've seen so far haven't been horrendous. I've certainly seen far worse in other years back when I was in Morris, but uh, there will be some problems because of those swaths blow, blowing around. So that's disappointing. Um, in the standing crop, there have been um, comments about pod drop in in the shatter proof varieties i did notice yesterday that it looks like that some of the some of the standing canola that there is shatter in there as well so that'll remain to be seen how how bad it is but um but yeah the wind did cause some significant damage next slide uh, you can pull though there's another two on this one yeah, so soybeans, a lot of folks are finished all their cereals now and um, and are done their canola. Um, I should have mentioned that the canola harvest is probably estimated at about 35 to 45% complete with quite a number of growers just waiting to get onto the beans. And uh, one fellow told me he was going to get into his early beans yesterday. Um, so we'll see how those are doing. But lots of fields that are Leaves are dropping fast. There's been a, a big change in the last week to 10 days. Um, we're hoping that the yields will be decent. We're we're thinking that probably those early maturing ones will uh, be the most disappointing just because of lack of rain. Uh, strictly the story there. Um, so this year, some of the later maturing ones hopefully will do better. There seem to be some additional fill after, you know, kind of the early August rain, so hopefully that'll bode well for the crop. Um, and surprising, even considered all the stresses of environment, there were still lots of four bean pods, lots of three bean pods. In early years, we would often only see a, a one, one or two bean pod when you had lots of stress, so some of these newer varieties are really hanging up quite well. Um, the big, biggest issue, of course, was on the lighter textured soils. So uh, sunflowers, um, a lot more sunflowers in, in the entry lake this year um, and all are progressing well. You can see that the backs of the heads are turning yellow. All, all the sunflowers in particular, but quite a number of the crops are much shorter than normal. Um, maybe not a bad thing for harvesties. On to the next. Yeah, two slides there. Oops, that uh, didn't make any comments about corn, but uh, corn is starting to dry down. Um, some folks report that there are very nice cobs in their fields, all again dependent on the rain. Um, but we expect to see some poor yields just because of all that um, drought stress and heat stress. Uh, Phil hasn't been all that great on some fields, so hopefully we'll get some good surprises, but um, people are tempering um, what they're expecting. There was quite a lot of corn silage that went in. We certainly need some additional um, feed for cattle. 
Um, on the lower left hand is actually green feed oats. There was a lot more green feed crops that were seeded oats, cereal mixes, barley, millet, uh, and that has been a really good addition for, for folks that are feeding cattle. And as I mentioned before, lots of straw being baled, so that's good. Uh, next, oh, I just wanted to throw this one up. These are the grasshoppers, and as I mentioned, we had some significant problems with grasshoppers. They were just thick, so um, hopefully We'll see some changes for next year, but these three consecutive dry years for the interlake have really have really increased some of those populations. And the next one is if you can see here the soil is lifted, and again soil is lifted. Nope, that's good. You can leave that one up. And the third picture. I had no idea um, that when crickets disappear, they've got all these little holes under the soil. I've never seen as much soil lifted as this year, and it's because of the population of crickets, which is great in terms of being a predator on grasshoppers. And I think that's about it. Um, yeah, we can just wrap it up there, all, other than saying that uh, we're short of, of um, hay and and pasture in the interlake. The recent rains have been very good for for letting the pasture hang on. But um, hay yields have turned out to actually be a little bit better than most people expected, but will still be below average. So so certainly we'll be looking for some additional feed there. And I'll wrap it up and turn it over to Amir, I think was next. Thanks, Ingrid. And yeah, we will uh start with uh, Amir. Uh, Amir is from the Southwest region. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? You bet Amir. Okay, thank you. So I will just uh, quick update from Southwest as uh, Lionel every week uh, gives some uh, updates from this area. So I will just uh, do some updates about the harvest. So the first uh, slide is for about cereals and peas. So overall harvest is 25 to 30% done in all the region. So barley is 80 to 90% done with good malt quality and average yield. So overall uh, producers are happy with the yield and quality with barley. And oats are 70% done with good yield. Spring wheat is 50 to 60% done with good, good quality and average to above average yield. So, and peas are done 100%, mostly very few odd fields are left. Otherwise, 99.9% uh, .9 is done. And uh, overall, excellent quality and uh, average to above average yield. So, next slide. These are the pictures uh, from uh, yesterday and uh, the previous from the season. And next is canola. Canola harvest is about 10 to 15 percent complete. And uh, mostly this harvest is done in uh, southern parts of the region, like in uh, south of number one highway. And canola harvest for the most part has not begun yet in northern parts of the region. Most of canola in north of number one highway is swathed lot of swathing is happening in past uh, one or two weeks, but uh, there is uh, not much harvesting done. Very few farmers, they actually has finished the harvest yet. And flax is ripening well and uh, out of frost danger at this stage because most of uh, the crop is on very good stage. Uh, this picture is uh, from <clears throat> yesterday that uh, those farmers they just start uh, swathing uh, that those can, that canola which was uh, still very green but uh, and very late canola but due to that harvest they just uh, start uh, to swath and next picture is uh, this was taken by Lionel early in the morning uh, just after the frost so you can see that how hard was the frost on this canola swath in this picture so we can we definitely have a very hard frost and i think in next hour specialist will talk about this this thing and next is soybean soybean was looking very great all over the uh, season in the spring in the whole summer 
but soybean is crop mostly at this stage is uh, some field were six at r6 stage 6.5 to like seed fill stage to r7 stage so some varieties are maturing earlier than others there are significant soybeans or later varieties which could be hit hard by the frost so damage will be determined later so variety selection in my view will be the most common single factor in especially in western manitoba and northern manitoba especially in the future and because we, you never know what is next coming and uh, when the early frost will start so it's very so this is the soybean picture uh, looks very good most of those fields were like good height and lot of pods and every mostly farmers were very satisfied this year because we got very good rains throughout the season so but unfortunately in next picture we can see this just got yesterday so those fields are looking disappointing right now especially with these uh, frost damage getting started because it's 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 it was very killing frost and i just visited a lot of fields yesterday and even our mcwet trial so even those leaves are already start to drop in so next is sunflower and corn so sunflowers are most of sunflowers are at, at our seventh stage most of crop was looking also very good promising crop before the frost so this frost may influence test weights as well on sunflowers and corn is at in most of the region is r5 stage so very few fields were beyond this stage prior to frost so this killing frost may harm the yield and test weight in corn in the southwest so these are some pictures from the uh, for sunflower so and then corn it's also already start to uh, drying up with this and showing the effects of frost so hopefully uh, we should be hoping that minimal damage to all these longer season crops so overall southwest region is looking was looking very good before this event so hopefully uh, other than soybean and corn most of these crops will be much better and good yield so best of luck for the upcoming harvest thank you hey thanks Samir. Uh, Laurie, let's turn it over to Terry. Okay, <clears throat> all good to go? You bet, Terry. Okay, here we go. I'm not going to repeat everything that's been set up till now. Many of the comments, particularly from Ingrid, would apply to us out here in the eastern region. I'm Terry Buss. I'm a farm production extension specialist out in, <clears throat> excuse me, Beauxager. Uh, so I'm up against the forest and the Canadian Shield heading into Ontario. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> just the weather. Everybody's talked about the weather so far. Uh, for us, this table is very deceiving. These are the weather stations in the eastern region. This is our latest weather report that we got, our latest seasonal summary. It's deceiving, as I say, um, especially on the rainfall side. Uh, every station is now starting to approach a more normal level of precipitation, but that has to be handled with a bit of caution. Many of the weather stations in the eastern region, particularly central and northern districts, were at 60% normal rainfall or even lower. Bose is your track at below 50 for a while for a good chunk of the season. We didn't, we had a period from, you know, sort of mid-June all the way through until the beginning of August where we got hardly any rain. And then there are some uh, stations that are from our southern districts and they have fairly impressive numbers. If you look at something like Gardenton, you're at 131%, but, we had what can only be described as a biblical rainfall event in spring out in some of our southern districts where the flooding was immense. Um, th those districts are still recovering from that tremendous event where they literally got 
eight to 10 inches of rain in a matter of eight to 10 hours or even tighter than that. So like I say, the average rainfall numbers now look pretty good. And 100% normal rainfall for us is usually a tad too much for annual crops. So you would think that things are hunky-dory, but those numbers are very deceiving. We've had weather events and rainfall events that have, that have not been all that pleasant. As of September 8th, uh, harvest we're saying is about 40% complete overall. And I'm just gonna work my way through the different crop types here. Um, frost, um, this was put up yesterday. I put this up just to show that uh, for the most part, we dodged the frost bullet that happened yesterday morning. Um, most of our stations were above zero. Um, there were a few that dipped below, but usually not in areas, not for very long or not in areas that had significant acres of crops. We had frost again this morning. Uh, we're still kind of figuring out that event. Most of our stations stayed above zero, although there is evidence of frost. Uh, in the, even in those areas where the stations were above zero. We had some weather stations get down maybe to minus one. So not the same kind of frost that we had yesterday out west as Amir was talking about, but we did have a touch of frost. Right now, we're not thinking it did very much. And in fact, it might speed up our soybean maturity a bit, but we do have a lot of rivers out here. And so often the frost is a lot more severe if you've got crop down by the river. So we're gonna see, we're gonna see where this goes this morning but we're not looking at a frost event like what the West had yesterday. Um, I think if there is significant damage, it's gonna be fairly localized. Winter wheat, we started harvest during the weekend of August 7th to 9th. We completed it on or before August 25th on limited acres. We don't have a lot of winter wheat out here and the acres of winter wheat seems to be on a slow decline. Yields were 65 to 75 bushels per acre range. Similar to spring wheat, producers weren't very pleased. Uh, our winter cereals did have a tough spring uh, given the temperatures. We had problems with not a lot of nodal roots being formed. I did walk a number of winter wheat fields that didn't look that great for a period of time and then started to recover in the spring. There weren't any real quality concerns, but again, the crop didn't perform in a way that pleased too many folks. It wasn't a great year for winter wheat out here. Field peas started harvest around August 7th to 9, completed it before August 25th. By We had 80% done by August 18th. Limited acres, but it's increasing over last year. We had a number of people out here growing for Roquette uh, and some other folks who expanded their acreages. We do have some long-term pea growers out here. Yield range was impressive overall, 60 to 80 bushels per acre. Quality was excellent. Uh, there weren't any concerns. Uh, so we had some, some folks have some really good experience with peas. However, it wasn't perfect for everyone. And even though for the vast majority of growers, it was a really good time for peas. This is an old picture by my farm, but it makes the point. I did walk pea fields this year that were wipeouts that crop insurance had to just pull the pin on, that the producer pulled the pin on because they were flooded out because of specific rainfall events where we got four to six inches happening in a couple of hours and so and many times these fields weren't very far apart from each other the most successful fields were located on the best drained soils producers did make an effort to try and put them in areas where they wouldn't be too flooded uh, but we still had some fields written off even though we had other fields that did 80 bushels an acre so go figure Peas did demonstrate, on the fields where things went well, peas did demonstrate two things. One, their early flowering, uh, so they got it done before it got horridly hot, because we had a lot of hot days out here, and also their incredible moisture use efficiency, their efficient use of water. So even though we were getting really, really dry, they were able to get the job done. Um, we'll see how it goes next year. It's always kind of up and down for us with peas. Hard red spring wheat and oats as of September 8th. Hard red spring wheat were about 80% done. Uh, yield reports from 55 to 70 bushels per acre. Quality one and two. Recent rainfall causing some bleaching. Proteins variable, 11 to 15 is kind of the range that we're hearing. Some of that has to do with how well fertilized the crop is. Some of it has to do with yields getting really high. Overall, people are very pleased with their wheat. Oats were about 90% complete as of yesterday. Yield reports are ranging from 100 to 130. We're not having some of the bin buster yields that we've had from time to time. We like to grow oats out here. We do it pretty well, 
but the 150s, 160s are elusive. Uh, so we're in that 100 to 130. Quality is good, but variability in bushel weight. Uh, we aren't seeing really stinky bushel weights, but we're seeing some lighter ones than what we saw last year or the year before. So people are being a bit cautious on that. Bushel weight varying field by field uh, as we go through it. Overall, cereals are a good news story for us out here, and people are generally quite pleased. Canola, not so pleased. Um, Pre-harvest herbicide applications and swathing is about 90% done. Things are dragging along for us. We That early June frost we had caused a lot of reseeding out here, plus some of the spring conditions led to late seeding out here. So we've got comb mining going on while we still got pre-harvest going on and swathing going on. I'm still getting calls about swathing and pre-harvest applications. So we're kind of all over the map on that one. Uh, harvest is about 25% complete across the region. Yield reports range from 25 to the absolute highest being 50. Um, people aren't pleased overall. Uh, we've had some just incredible canola yields over the last two years. And so it's all relative to past experience. I'm getting a lot of folks who aren't happy. Um, it's not a disaster, but it's not pleasing. Uh, quality's been go good. As I say, overall producers disappointed with yields. A lot of folks are looking for answers on this because they're looking to expand or, or still grow a fair bit of canola next year. I would point to the number one problem we had is hot and dry conditions during early to mid flowering and initial pod set. We had some hot days and we were running short of water. Um, that doesn't seem to please folks. And so they're looking at things like insect damage, we did have, and you've heard from Ingrid, we had a very similar experience with cutworms, we had flea beetles, we had grasshoppers, we had challenges on our cereals with armyworms, the grasshoppers, grasshoppers, grasshoppers. We had dealers running out of running out of insecticide from time to time. Uh, so we had a fair bit of spraying going on, but I think weather had an awful lot to do with the canola yields we're seeing. Uh, June frost damage to crop that wasn't reseeded, that's something that's being pointed at. A lot of folks are spending time on diseases. My disease surveys didn't show a whole lot of disease, but it's a discussion that's going on right now in the community is that we've got issues with diseases. Um, one thing to mention, Ingrid showed some pictures, wind damage to swaths and standing canola on September 6th. We had some mighty gusts out here. The neighbor's pergola decided to come visit my deck. Um, and so there has, been, there has been swath canola blown around and some of it out here is pretty bad and it's gonna take a lot to get it sorted out. Soybeans, mostly we're in R7. Um, I think we're in a good solid R7. There's a brown pot on most everything out here. Early maturing varieties, some of our seed producers that are growing seed for, for on contract, some of them are close to 95% brown pod with seed rattling. They're, they're, they're looking at dry down coming on soon. Yield potential is variable. Wilting was evident, particularly at later flower and pod filling. We had a lot of wilting going on out here. Um, and some of those top potting opportunities were lost in some fields. Most crops have good pod height and they're fairly tall soybean crops for this year. Uh, yield wise, it's gonna be variable. I've seen everything from crops that are gonna yield above average and potentially significantly above average to ones that are gonna be below average. So overall, um, I think it's going to be kind of an average time of it. Um, certainly, we our crops are farther ahead than what you heard from Amir, uh, and even the frost this morning is likely to be our friend rather than our enemy on, on our soybean crops. Corn, most of our corn uh, is in the dent. Milk line about 50%, that's an average. It varies widely by variety. Um, so, the corn's looking okay so far. We'll see if we frosted any leaves uh, later on today when when we get a chance to take a look. Moisture stress became evident, especially during during August, late July. Pollination seemed to go okay. Kernel numbers seem to be all right on the cobs. We'll see how filling was impacted by our dry conditions. Um, the recent rainfall, our rainfall that started late earlier on in August, seemed to really pick up the condition of our corn and our soy. So we'll see how that goes. It's kind of, we're not, we're, we're looking at the crop and it's not, we've seen worse when it comes to drought, uh, putting an end to the crop. We've had worse years than this. So we're kind of mixed on our outlook for corn and uh, we're really going to have to see how the filling went. Like I say, the 
kernel number looked okay, but filling is our concern. Silaging is being held up by the weather. Lots of corn silage made, especially in the mid to southern parts of the region, and that's just being held up because it keeps drizzling and raining and spitting on us. Uh, some areas, particularly northern districts out here, have had a lot more rain than other parts of the province. In the last week, we've had over 35 millimeters here in Bozizer, so it's it's slowing things down. Sunflowers, we grow a fair bit out here. Uh, we we have a long history of sunflowers. Most of the crop is somewhere in the R7. Our, our flowers are more advanced than, than certainly some other areas, uh, such as out west. We're in that R7 growth stage, we're moving along. Producers are starting to make plans around their desiccation later this month, unless we're lucky and we get a really good hard killing frost at the end of September that does the job. Major concern for us right now, because we're having this misty sort of, it's like we're living in Britain right now, it's raining every hour, uh, we have some concerns around head integrity. Um, we've got a good crop of sunflowers out there as far as we can tell. We are concerned that if it keeps getting wet and sloppy that we're gonna start having our heads degrade. We've had that happen last year in the crop and we certainly don't wanna see that happen again. Like I say, yield potential and quality look very promising at this time. We've had increased acres of sunflowers uh, because we've had a lot of growers who have good experience with the crop come back into it after two years of very successful crops. Um, that's my last picture. It's a bad day when I have to come pull you out, as I do do for some neighbors. Uh, we're hoping that uh, we avoid this. Uh, we would like to see it dry up so we can get back to business. We've got a lot to get done. I do have some producers who are caught up on everything, and now they're waiting for their soy, as Ingrid mentioned. Uh, but I have quite a few folks that still have cereals that have to be picked up and a lot of canola to go. So we're 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 sticky and we're standing still right now. It's not the wettest it's been. It's not a disaster. It's not soup out there, but we really need things to change gears here uh, so that we can get something done. If that happens, we can make a heck of a lot of progress in the next two weeks. That's all I had, Lionel. Okay, thanks, Terry. Uh, Lori, I'll get you to turn the screen over to me. Great, and. We're gonna get into our crop scouting panel and we've got a few questions uh, for this week. Uh, the first one's gonna to go to Dennis Lang and we've been talking about soybeans and how they're gonna be affected by this frost. And I think more for the guys in the Western side of the province, Dennis, uh, any thoughts as to uh, what they can look for in their beans to see for quality uh, and you know, I guess whatever decisions they have. Sure. Uh, if you want to show my screen here or share my screen, I guess I got a few things I'd like to present here. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to go full screen here. So I got a few pictures here yesterday and uh, uh, from some soybeans in the West. So on the left here, a um, picture from just uh, north of Brandon area there. Uh, this is just before lunchtime. You can see here that these soybeans were still fairly green yet when the frost hit. Uh, the leaves are starting to wilt, so you're definitely going to see some top back uh, um, uh, frost damage in there. Um, from the same area as well, the growers also growing some dry beans. Uh, they seem to be hit a little bit harder uh, in that respect because there's less leaf material there. So, um, and you you see some you might see some damages to the pods. And uh, this is from yesterday as well. And you can see here this is just uh, west of Morden up on the escarpment Tuesday morning. Uh, here on the on the uh, dry beans, you can actually start to see this kind of this translucent appearance in some of the pods. Um, they become they start to smell, you know, very fruity at that stage. So in these fields, I could definitely see um, in the dry beans, anyways, some you know higher amounts of damage. Uh, the soybeans, for the most part, I think should be okay because it's mostly top growth that we're going to see there. So uh, they are starting to they'll they will start to drop leaves, but as Terry mentioned, it will try to it will hasten maturity. Um, this is uh, something I pulled up Twitter this morning. It's from Rob Orr, who's a retired retired environmental uh, environment Canada meteorologist. Um, we did dip down in some areas to zero and even just to the minus uh, uh, 0.5 and even minus one for short periods of time at around 6 a.m. But for the most part, I think we're still going to be okay. There's a few pockets here that did dip down for longer periods, so you're def you're definitely going to see some damage in there as well. Um, so one of the things that comes up, and I had this on last week's slide, but I, 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 uh, I'll touch on it again, 
uh, when you get that light frost or, or even you know a little heavier frost and you have a lot of leaf canopy in the soybeans what you'll see typically is a lot of this uh, you know burn back on the top leaves these black pods I wanted you to pay attention to that's a normal maturity thing on some varieties they, they tend to turn black it's more of a sunburning thing so it's really not an indicator of frost um, again uh, one of the same pictures on the left and you can see here this was a site in Hamiota from a couple of years ago and uh, overall um, we stopped doing maturity ratings at that point but we did get some good yields off of that that year so uh, that part is uh, is a good thing a uh, few things to kind of keep in mind when you do get that hard frost as you did it out in the west uh, what you'll see happen is in the top uh, four nodes if those seeds aren't quite fully mature yet uh, maybe early R6, uh, you'll probably start to see a little bit of this green uh, mature, uh, green seed kind of lock in. Uh, some of it will change. This is a very extreme looking sample. Um, I don't expect them to look quite this severe. Uh, this was from a couple years or a few years ago where their grower had uh, significant frost damage. Uh, it was up in the interlake area there and um, there, there they saw some. Uh, just a closer look here. You can really see the ones in here, the, the, the if I look at some of these samples here, uh, there's a few that have a tinge of green. Those will probably disappear. These really harsh green ones uh, will probably shrink up. It's the ones that are kind of in between. And what the Grain Commission typically does, I'm just gonna go ahead and slide. Um, what they typically do for grading is they'll, uh, they'll cut those seeds in half. And then uh, you can see here, this is the rating scale they use. So to go from mature to immature, uh, for green seed issues, it's a pretty fine line. Uh, for the most part, we haven't seen any real quality issues with soybeans in Manitoba. Um, from the Grain Commission, what they typically do for that for the grading system, and this is what the elevators would do, uh, they'd remove the dockage from the sample. Um, you know, they're working uh, the working sample is from 60 to 100 grams that they're looking for frost damage. They'll actually cut those in half, and they'll uh, those suspect kernels and look and see what the percent total is. So. For a number three Canada, you're, you're allowed 5%. For a number two Canada, where most of the beans are sold, you're allowed 3%. So for the most part, you're probably still gonna be okay uh, for damage. As far as yield loss goes, um, we're mostly in that R6 growth stage in, in the beans that are in the far west. And uh, this area here, we're, we're in that into that R7. So you can see up to 30% yield loss at R6 if it's a hard killing frost. Um, and uh, if it's just a light frost, you probably won't notice much of that. You might just notice those top pods go, so it would be at the lower end. If you're at R7, uh, yield loss is pretty negligible. negligible. Uh, for the most part, I think the beans should be okay. Uh, it will hasten maturity, and because there's enough green leaf material there, uh, you uh, shouldn't see too much of an issue with, uh, um, with you know, loss of yield. Might see a few green kernels. On the dry bean side, uh, in the fields that are out west, there you might see higher amounts of pick, uh, but still a workable product yet for most uh, for most growers. So um, that's kind of what I had on frost damage. I think the 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 final uh, total or the final uh, decision will be, I guess, once we pull in there and see what see what happens. Um, the green seed sometimes does change in the bin, uh, but what I would suggest to growers is if you do notice a few green kernels in there and the beans are mature. Um, you could wait a few days, but typically, uh, if those beans are mature, I would say continue harvesting as long as the percentage is, is a is a workable level. So, and that's all I have for today. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Lori, if you could uh, give the screen back to me. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, this one's for Tim Clark. He's joining us today uh, in the panel. Um, this came from a producer down in the Melita area. We're having our, uh, sorry, a crop scout down in the Melita area and having producers concerned about frost and second cut alfalfa. When would be the best time to cut it? And is there any concerns with nitrates? Sure, yeah, so can you hear me, Lionel? You bet, Tim. Okay, good. Yeah, we uh, recommend not cutting alfalfa from, uh, well, the non, the critical non-harvest date starts around August uh, 13th up in up in the North Country, and down in Morden it starts at around August 23rd. And we recommend not cutting from that from that point on until we get a minus three degree frost for four to six hours. 
So in this example, it looks like it got a pretty hard frost. So we would not expect the plant to regrow after this. And so we could, after the frost is off that day, we could cut this uh, plant and harvest it without risking uh, reducing the uh, uh, carbohydrate reserves in the roots. When the plant regrows, um, if the plant regrows, then it will, will withdraw carbohydrates out of the roots. And if it regrows to about six or eight inches, then it'll have redu uh, withdrawn most of the carbohydrate reserves out of the roots. And uh, if it goes into winter like that, then we, it would uh, be high risk for winter kill. And uh, Okay, any much, concerns about nitrates in, in alfalfa? Generally, no, because, uh, you know, nit uh, alfalfa fixes nitrogen. And whenever we've done our nitrate spot tests in the offices here, we found that the nitrate levels are quite low in legumes. Uh, however, in grass crops, they tend to be higher. So in uh, crops like late seeded millet or late seeded oats, you may have nitrates. Uh, they can be managed. So uh, there are some things that we should consider when, when managing nitrate contaminated feed. Um, first of all, in siling, in siling uh, feed that, that has nitrates in it will reduce nitrate content by 40 to 50%. And um, when we're feeding it to our cattle, we should introduce nitrate contaminated feed slowly into the diet and only feed nitrate contaminated feed to as a proportion of the ration. And the last and most important thing based upon personal experience is that we should never feed nitrate contaminated feed uh, three weeks before calving until three weeks after calving. And that's because newborns are much more sensitive to nitrates than are mature animals. And so the fetus inside the mother gets uh, nitrates through the bloodstream and uh, they're much more sensitive and we can have a lot of grief at calving with stillborn calves and really weak calves if their mothers have been consuming nitrate contaminated feeds up until the time of calving. Okay, thanks, Tim. You're welcome. Next question is going to go to Dane, and uh, it's regarding canola and the eight hours of so of minus two to minus three weather we had. Um, this came from a producer from Hartney. Uh, canola would have been swathed at the end of the week, and that's the end of this week. It's pod shattered variety. Should I be swathing it? Is it still going to be any saleable seed? And going to take about three days to get the field swathed. So, any comments, Dane? Certainly. Um, I guess my first question for the grower would be: Is were they swathing at the regular 60% seed color change window, or were they targeting a late swath, given that it was a pod shattered variety? That I think will when make he called a difference. Me the first time uh, he was looking at uh, thinking it would be the same, being able to spray it at the end of this week. Okay. okay. So then we would be looking at at least 60% seed color by the end of this week. So it went a couple days sooner. So I would estimate that it might be 40 to 50% seed color change at that time, meaning uh, seed moisture content could be around uh, 30%, 30, 35%. Uh, eight hours of minus two to minus three is certainly a killing frost. Um, canola will tolerate uh, some cold conditions for a, a certain amount of time, but given that this canola crop was uh, as advanced as it was, um, I'm expecting damage is going to be a little more limited in this case than, than widespread. Certainly there will be some green seed in there, uh, but I do expect that there is going to be a saleable product here and you should still achieve uh, a reasonable grade and, and yield. Um, if it's a pod shatter variety, um, no particular urgency to swath uh, right now or continue to swath. Uh, if it was planned for the end of this week, I mean, proceed as, as you would normally, but keep an eye on that crop. Frost may tend to split open the pods, but that isn't as severe on pod shatter tolerant lines as regular uh, canola. What is more likely to happen is that pods may begin to drop. If that is the case and pods start dropping uh, sooner after this, these frost conditions, waiting four to six hours to go take a look um, and seeing if that tissue is drying out will give you an indication of when you should start swathing. If that pod drop is starting to occur now, certainly uh, cut that crop down, put it in a swath, 
uh, sooner rather than later. If it was a regular canola variety, I would say uh, perhaps let it stand because then having a regular canola crop exposed to frost, swathed, and then uh, harvested at a later date is handling that crop twice. And, and there's much more likely um, or a greater chance of those pods then being shattered open and, and split open. So, so you might want to manage it differently. Pod shatter tolerance does help in this case. Okay, so yeah, that was one of his questions was, uh, is if it's pod shatter, will the pod shatter still work? Or and you're saying the pod shatter should still work, but you might see some pod drop. That's right. Okay, good. Thanks, Dane. Tim, uh, thanks for hanging on. Uh, one more question for you. Uh, the frost is going, how is frost going to affect uh, my corn silage, so the leaves are turning brown already, like Amir's picture here, and they were just starting to dent. Any comments on that? Well, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that because most years uh, corn is chopped after frosts. So uh, the ensiling process uh, reduces nitrates by about 40 to 50 percent, and we should time our corn chopping according to the uh, milk line on the cob. So we want between 1 8 and 7 8 milk line, preferably around 50% milk line. And we want to have the moisture content of the silage at 70% or less. Uh, ideally is 67% moisture, you get the best feed value. Uh, over 70% and you're likely to have effluent run out of your silage pile and you likely have butyric acid formation in the pile, which is not good. It's uh, it's uh, anti-nutritional. Uh, if you get it under 67%, then you'll have lactic acid form, which is what we want uh, to drop the pH so that it'll ensile properly and pickle. And I wouldn't get in too much of a hurry to chop right now, unless you've had that corn crop has been drought stressed for quite a while, and then it might be under 60%. 67% moisture standing. Uh, I've seen fairly often when people get anxious and they get a frost early on in August and they'll go and chop and it'll be 75% moisture and there'll be lots of effluent running out of the pile. The pile will not uh, properly ferment and it'll be poor quality silage in the end from getting too hasty and chopping it too early. Okay. Good and uh, so your uh, stock and your cob are your are your main main source of silage. Anyways, the leaves usually are dried up by the time it comes to silaging. That's right. They don't represent a lot of the of the plant uh, by weight. They they uh, take up a lot of area, but they don't amount to a lot of actual mass in the pile. Great. Thanks, Tim. You're welcome. Okay, that's the questions for the panel today. We've gone a little bit over time, so I just want to talk a few things about some of the, the Manitoba hay listing. Uh, as Ingrid mentioned, there's still some areas that are short feed. You got feed, put it on the hay listing. Uh, crop residue burning, uh, again, check if you're going to burn. And uh, that's, uh, there's the rest of my slides. Sorry, Ingrid, I had you on here twice. So join us uh, next week, September the 16th, uh, for our next edition of uh, Crop Talk. Thanks for attending.